Hello and welcome to Office Hours. I'm Brent Ozar. Okay, I'm kind of Brent Ozar. I mean, this is actually me recording this, but I'm recording it through my Apple Vision Pro. Sometimes I like to do this every now and then to show you what the state of the art, I'm doing air quotes, but of course you can't see that because the hand capture doesn't work. Oh, there it goes. Oh, there it goes. I just have to get out in front of my camera. I'm doing a state of the art uh, virtual reality. This is what Apple Vision Pro personas look like. They're still in beta um, and you can kind of see why. There's that creepy uncanny valley where it's kind of sort of uh, you know a decent capture of me but not really. It is kind of amazing that it's recording this with the Vision Pro strapped to my face. This is just with the Vision Pro strapped to my face, no external cameras, um, and it figures out with the little cameras aimed inside at your eyelids and the cameras aimed outside at your hands uh, what's going on with your face. It's pretty wild how this stuff works. I promise not to do this too often, but I think y'all will have a laugh out of it uh, every now and then. So let's see, the top voted question is from a T-SQL querying who asks, how can I tell if an operator in an execution plan is done by the storage engine or not? For example, how can I measure the impact of IO latency on key lookups? Well, here's the problem with what you're trying to do. Think about an execution plan that hits lots of different tables that has things like sorts in it at different stages, things that go parallel so the IO operations are different on different threads. Some pages may be cached, some pages may not. As you start to think about that, you'll understand how hard it would be to accomplish. What you really want to do is zoom out a little. You see, if I actually walk away from it, it kind of redoes the camera. And then if I step in closer, yeah, oh God, it's creepy. Now, what you really want to do is zoom out and say, is IO a problem for this query? You can do that by capturing query level wait stats on a modern version of SQL Server. If you run queries with the actual execution plan turned on, uh, you'll get the query stats for or the wait stats over in the properties. Right click on the select operator, for example, go into properties and down near the bottom of the properties pane, there'll be wait stats and you can see which wait stats your query is waiting on. If it's I.O., you're going to want to just reduce the I.O. And I.O. wait stats can be things like page I.O. latch. Uh, they can be TempDB spills, all kinds of stuff. Um, if, you're wait, if you're waiting, if the query is waiting on storage and you want to make it go faster, there are a few different ways that you can do that. You're probably not going to change the I.O. latency of your entire server just you know on a whim. If you're in the cloud, you may you know turn up the, the bill, so to speak. You may give yourself more IOPS, but otherwise, you're not going to just randomly speed up the storage on a production server. If you could do that, you would have done that already by now. And what you want to do is read less data. And to do that, that's where things like query tuning and index tuning come in. So just as a summary, zoom out, ask what weight stats you're waiting on right now for that query, and then go tackle those weight stats holistically at the query level. Stop trying to take a screwdriver to one particular uh, query plan operator and say, I want to change this one. You know, it just isn't going to work all that well. Uh, next up, James says, I remember a while ago you mentioned a website that looks at what large businesses require in a product that uses databases and it compares features across products. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about there. I've never seen a good comparison across databases. What you might be thinking of is EnterpriseReady.io. EnterpriseReady.io gives you a list of the kinds of features that enterprises look for in any application that they buy. Things like single sign-on, auditing, uh, transparent data encryption, and so forth. Um, that's totally free, and it's out at EnterpriseReady.io. I have no affiliation with them. It's just cool. Uh, let's see next. Fu asks, do you see any issues with locating both tempdb and the Windows page file on ephemeral storage? Well, so on, on Azure ephemeral storage, but the question's the same, whether it's AWS, Google, uh, whatever. So the thing you want to think about is, do you really hit the Windows page file 
on a working SQL Server. What would be a condition where, in SQL Server, you need to hit the page file and performance matters? If you run out of real physical memory, it's me trying to make a horrified face in VR, if you run out of physical memory, you got bigger problems. It doesn't really matter how fast the page file is. You are screwed. That's why in our SQL Server setup checklist, we tell you what to set SQL Server's max memory at uh, so that you can avoid swapping to disk. Once you swap to disk, you're kind of screwed. Um, so I, I really don't care where you put it. The time when you hit it, game over in terms of performance. So you're fine with putting it on the same drive if you want to. Uh, next up, Dom asks, uh, in your experience, what would you say the percentage of businesses are that are still or that are doing instance stacking, i.e., uh, and same thing with using uh, the non-default ports for SQL Server? In my experience, it's fairly limited, but I do have to say that in my experience, when do people call me? They call me when they're worried about performance on a SQL Server. Generally, if you're worried about performance, you don't stack multiple instances of SQL Server on the same box. Just like if you're trying to do fast performance testing for cars, like if you're trying to test 0 to 60 or 0 to 100 metrics, you don't pack a bunch of clowns in the car before your testing starts. You try to keep that weight relatively light. Especially since virtualization, I mean, most people will just stack, a, will set up multiple VMs on the same host when they need to run different instances. Now, I say that as a consultant because, you know, what's my big job is performance tuning. I'm sure there are lots of people out there who say, we don't really care how fast it goes. We cram lots of clowns into the same car. And that, that's totally fine. I, there are enterprises who just pack, uh, they'll run 10 instances of SQL Server on a cluster, and they're not doing it for performance tuning. They're doing it because they just are lazy and cheap. So there you go. Those aren't my clients, though. Go figure. Next up, Janice asks, uh, uh, with mainstream support being done for SQL Server 2019, is it time to move on to 2022? So as we record this, it's April of 2025. There isn't a public release out yet of SQL Server 2025. There's supposed to be preview releases. They're usually supposed to, I say supposed to be, it's not like there's any kind of biblical playbook. In the past, Microsoft has done several preview releases. Oh, it's kind of, it's like, a, it's like my fingers are made out of hot dogs. They've done several preview releases leading up to the release to manufacturing. They may not do that. They may still do that. But if they do do that, and if they launched a public preview today, it still wouldn't be out until the end of 2025. I don't understand why they're doing this release stuff. Why would If I'm going to turn in my homework, I want my homework to look early, not late. If I'm going to turn out a version of, say, SQL Server, if I'm going to put it out in December of 2025, I don't want to name it 2025. Because by the time it gets to people's hands, they're like, oh, that's so last year. You know, we're already looking forward to 2026. I don't understand why they keep doing this. Um, so regardless, either where we're at is I don't see a release to manufacturing of 2025 coming anytime soon. Having said that, your question is, when should you start moving to 2022? What's your rush? What is it specifically in 2022 that you're looking for that you need? If there's not something specific that you're looking for that you need, why not wait a few more months uh, and see what 2025 starts to look like? Because after all, it's not like you're doing these migration projects every day. It's a big pain in the butt to do migration projects. You want to do it once and then l wait as long, you know, be on there as long as you possibly can. Especially if, if I check my Apple Watch that you can't see on screen, if you're running SQL Server 2019 today, that's already six years old. I can tell, Speedy, that you don't do upgrade projects too often. Why not wait a little bit longer and see what happens with 2025? That's what I would do if I had the choice. Uh, and then we'll do one more. Southernmost says, Hi, Brent. 
how can I horizontally scale out our heavy OLTP databases to offload writes across multiple databases? I'm looking for alternatives to partitioning. Is sharing hot tables between databases a viable solution? So as soon as you say, I need to scale rights across, uh, that I have a bottleneck on rights, my very first question is, what's the exact bottleneck that you're facing? Are you facing, for example, hater sync commit? Are you facing the bottleneck that means that you're waiting to write to an availability group secondary? If you are, you probably shouldn't do re-architecture. You should probably first tune that to make sure that you're not waiting on slow storage over on the other replica or that it's not too far apart. Or switch to failover clustered instances, FCIs, using shared storage. If, on the other hand, your bottleneck is write log, the write log wait stat, meaning you're waiting to write to the transaction log, the first place that I go and check is what's going on with your storage, because you should be able to get storage to respond within one to three milliseconds. Then the next questions further into that would be how many indexes do you have in your tables? Are we writing stuff that we shouldn't be to the database? And I know it sounds funny, but honest to God, I literally just had a client yesterday where we canceled the, the consulting engagement because we popped open and we looked at they were facing write bottlenecks, write log bottlenecks. And the, all of the writes were happening in a queuing table. They had this queuing table that they built in a relational data in Microsoft SQL Server. And uh, we were talking about it. And I'm like, so are, do you have alternatives to that? You, it's, I don't know what queuing app you're using, but usually you don't want to do queuing in a relational database if you can afford it, if, if there's another way place uh, that you can go dump that queue somewhere else. And the developers on the call were like, oh, yeah, we actually moved that whole queuing process over out of the database entirely last night. I'm like, you did it last night? You did it last night, and then we came out, and there were all kinds of other changes that they'd made last night, too. But generally speaking, try and get the stuff you don't need in a relational database. Go get that out elsewhere. I have personally never had a client where the solutions that I just, who wanted to, to split rights for performance reasons, I'm being very careful there, performance reasons, I've never had a client who wanted to split for performance reasons where what I just described, the hater sync commit weights and the write log weights, didn't completely fix the issue. That as soon as we got past those, they were like, oh, you know what? Could actually write a lot. But if you're in a position where you need to do sustained inserts of more than, and I'm just going to pull a round number, 100,000 rows per second sustained for long periods of time, like seven hours, eight hours, nine hours on end, 100,000 rows per second. If you're hitting that point, yes, you probably want to split out across multiple instances. I have never seen, I know they exist. A friend of mine, Thomas Grosser out of New York City, uh, does this with stock trades and has pools of SQL servers. But I literally, he is the only guy I know, the only person I know who has ever faced that problem where we couldn't fix it with just the write log and hater sync commit stuff that we talked about earlier. Um, uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. I don't know whose quote that is, if that's Newth's or who that is. Um, but focus on the problems that you have today. Odds are, if you just take care of those, you're going to have much less problems going down the road than you think about. Most companies don't need multiple SQL servers to handle rights. I mean, you know, the classic example is uh, stuff like auction sites like eBay or uh, uh, stackoverflow.com. Um, where as you start to really push scale, you discover, oh, I just need to kind of fix my code, and then off you go. Okay, there's a good long office hours uh, with me with the headset on. Hope you all got laughs out of uh, creepy virtual reality Brent. Uh, have fun, and I will see y'all on the next. See if we can get a wave in here. So, oh, look at that. When I wave my hand, the fingers kind of go like hot dogs independently. That's weird. And uh, man, virtual reality has a long, long way to go. I, 
the only time I ever use this headset is on planes. On planes, I use it to watch movies and to work. It's so wide open. It makes the plane seem huge because you get this virtual reality environment where you can be on a beach or uh, in the mountains. And it just makes even like economy seats feel giant and comfortable because uh, it looks like there's so much space around you. That's literally the only time that I use it. And I've thought about selling this thing uh, and then switching it out for one of Huawei's trifold phones. I know they're called trifold, but they only fold twice. That thing, we had a chance to play with it hands on last time I was in China. That thing is amazing. That thing is so fantastic to just have a, uh, a phone in your hand. And then you flip it open, and then all of a sudden it's a full-blown tablet. That is, it's not virtual reality, obviously. It's a totally different technology. But if I was going to spend $3,000 on a piece of technology to make my life easier in airplanes, it would be that, not the Apple Vision Pro, most likely. I don't know how they're going to fix this either. Like, I don't know. It's not as revolutionary as we thought it was. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful to use. But... I just don't usually want to strap a two-pound you know, device onto my head and uh, walk around. It's just kind of goofy. And especially when you see the state of the art, like the Persona stuff is so weirdly bad. It's impressive, but it's still weirdly creepy and bad. All right, talk to you all later. Adios.